Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we're going to talk about ESG, environmental, social and governance risks and opportunities that the commodities world faces. We're going to put some definitions around it and also talk about the drivers behind it and some of the risks. One thing is for sure is that ESG is going to become an increasingly important topic over the next decade, determining access to markets, finance, and even talent. Joining us to discuss is Milena Lopez. Milena is the founder and CEO of Keops Consulting, a management consultancy focused on the commodities markets and ESG. Previously, Milena was head of commodities structuring in Latin America for Deutsche Bank, and similarly head of environmental finance in the region as well. Milena, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Before we dig into some of the complexity around ESG and the drivers and the pros and the cons um, and the opportunity available to organizations, could you just, at a very basic level, uh, give us some definitions around what ESG actually means and why it's so important, why it's so relevant to the, the energy and commodities sector? So I think the first is to understand what is sustainability. Sustainable development means meeting our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So it's made up of three pillars, that is the environment, the economy, and the society. So ESG, that is environmental, social, and governance, are three specific factors in measuring a company's uh, risks outside of a financial accounting uh, framework. ESG factors may overlap and may be categorized under different measures. But ESG is an approach of um, on how to identify non-financial risks that may have a material impact on an asset value. For energy and the commodities world, is is very important because the environmental component is inherent in any commodity transaction. And it's part also of um, the supply chain that is part of the scope three emissions. You know, when companies measure their emissions, uh, they have a scope one, two and three. Uh, one is the part of the emissions from the own or, or control source. Two, the emissions come from uh, the energy purchase. And the three are the indirect emissions from the value change. So. In all the commodities transactions, uh, we'll have uh, these, uh, these scopes. And there are ways uh, to reduce emissions, but also as the ESG factors, they overlap. The social and the governance uh, component are critical for commodities businesses. So right off the bat, we should say, it's not about every organization in the energy and commodities world has right now ESG risks. It's what we're talking about in the course of this podcast is how do you have a plan to measure those risks and to tackle them and actually the benefits behind doing so, right? Yes, exactly. So ESG analysis aims to price the social, the environmental and the economic risks, but also the opportunities within a business from the investors or, or the financier perspective but also for for a business to improve and be able to capture those opportunities and manage uh, those risks. Why is it becoming such a prominent discussion or topic within organizations in the energy and commodities sector? What are the what are the drivers? Can you help us understand some of the drivers that are pushing this subject to the fore? Well, there are different drivers. Um, I will say uh, a primary driver for ESG is um, the regulated and the compliance sector, because governments uh, worldwide are enacting measures to promote uh, ESG issues, and uh, they cover different sectors and, and industries. On top of this, uh, for example, financial regulators like um, the FCA in, in the UK, uh, they have published a comply or explain rules uh, for company disclosure in line with the recommendations of the Tax Force on, on Climate-Related uh, Financial Disclosures, uh, that is a standard for measuring ESG. For example, also in the US, the CFTC have released a, a report last year 
that identifies uh, climate change as a potential uh, systematic risk, meaning that it's a risk that uh, threatens um, the stability of the financial markets. And in the report, they, um, they advise on uh, establishing um, a price on carbon and, and companies disclosing scope one, two, and three of emissions. Scope one is um, emissions from own or controlled sources. Scope two um, are indirect emissions from purchased energy. And scope three are all other indirect emissions across the value chain. You know, so this affects suppliers, you know, and uh, could affect suppliers within the U.S. or outside the U.S. On top of that, like central banks have announced um, stress testing for climate change. Uh, so th this is part of, um, of one of the drivers. The other one is that um, among investors, uh, there is a growing conviction that companies with um, higher ESG performance are likely to have a better financial performance, uh, talent retention, and uh, long-term value creation. So this, so you've got this. There's the companies are, are effectively having to do this to be able to operate in the various jurisdictions and markets they operate as a result of regulators. So this is essentially forced ESG initiatives. I think where it gets really fascinating is that you have what we're really talking about here is these organisations in essentially voluntarily launching in ESG initiatives, whether that's um, how they measure their own um, attributes or how they take on various projects to get ahead of, well, in part to get ahead of regulators, but actually because there are real drivers, real incentives to promote uh, ESG attributes within your organization, correct? Yes, exactly. No, so some businesses are being forced because uh, of compliance issues, depending where they are located. Some of them, therefore, uh, because investors, you know, are influencing on, on their corporate decisions on matters of, of ESG. And others is because in anticipation of uh, future climate change regulation, uh, they want to be ahead of the curve. They want to start incorporating ESG analysis uh, to be better prepared. And um, also they request their suppliers, you know, so uh, this goes in line with the scope three, you know, so it's not only the companies implementing um, ESG plans, but also asking their suppliers to do the same. And this is very interesting because a strong ESG proposition can help also companies to attract and retain quality employees, um, enhance uh, employee motivation and, and productivity. And employee satisfaction is uh, very uh, positively uh, related with shareholder returns. Yeah, so you've got... The invest, oh, we've seen that. That's a, a, a product of 2020 was a number of, um, whether it's um, private equity firms stating that they only invest in organizations that meet certain ESG standards. You've had the, the, fi the financial markets themselves are applying a, a true discount and conversely a premium to organizations depending on, on their perceived ESG. What you're talking about there is internally as well. You're, you're seeing if organizations, if companies are really at root all about the talent that they hold and how they, they motivate those talent, how productive that talent is, this is becoming a real factor for whether individuals want to join a company or not. Is, is, is that what you're seeing? Yes, exactly. ESG is um, a big factor for driving new talent and especially new generations you know, uh, to, to consider uh, where they want to work. Mm. So you, you definitely see a lower cost of capital. You're seeing more of investment available to organizations with stated ESG goals that are measurable. Are we actually seeing improved financial performance as organizations start to tackle these issues? I think there's a common understanding you know, that uh, companies with the strong ESG plans have better success uh, increasing their returns. They are better prepared to address uh, climate change uh, challenges, you know, because uh, ESG is, is about um, um, identifying the risks, setting up uh, targets and managing those risks and uh, identifying risks and on opportunities. So before we, because I, I want to move on to not only this is incredibly challenging, uh, but also how companies should start thinking and individuals should start thinking about or, or how you advise them about how they should start thinking about ESG plans. 
it seems that there are two big categories which organizations in the energy and commodity space are tackling or using to deliver ESG into their organizations. One is very prominent in the news is carbon neutrality targets. Uh, the other is sustainable development goals. Could you give us an understanding of both, perhaps starting on you know, what organizations mean by these carbon neutrality targets and how, and how prevalent that is in the market right now? Mm -hmm. This is a big trend. We've seen a lot of corporates uh, announcing and also banks announcing targets uh, for zero emissions or net zero emissions you know, uh, with different target dates. And, and uh, a way you know, to reduce these emissions is internally and implementing their own projects, buying um, uh, renewable energy you know, for, for their own energy consumptions. But also there's a point where they cannot reduce uh, internally their their emissions, you know, and uh, they um, an integral part of, of meeting these uh, uh, net zero targets are um, uh, offsetting uh, and buying uh, carbon credits in you know, order to compensate uh, their emissions. I think this is going to be key for companies uh, meeting the, their targets. Then uh, you ask about sustainable development goals. You know, uh, this is different. You know, this is um, a UN target um, by uh, 2030, and uh, there are 17 uh, sustainable development goals that can provide some guidance on, on how to meet zero net uh, targets. I, I think uh, both are different, but they're complementary. One is reducing emissions, and the other one is is more broad and might not be applicable or the sustainable development goals uh, to to every country. But uh, companies can choose, you know, the ones that are more suitable according to their sector or or their base. So you've got these seventeen different categories of, of of SDGs. What are the benefits of signing up to one of those or multiple of those standards in any given project? Well, sustainable development goals are not like, um, they're not the standards, you know, so they're like uh, goals set up by the UN. And some of these are like uh, clean water and sanitation, uh, gender equality, reduce inequalities, industry, innovation and, and infrastructure, responsible consumption and, and production, you know. So they're different um, uh, from um, what are in ESG uh, standards, you know, uh, the, the ESG standards, they, they focus more on uh, climate change and emissions uh, reductions, you know. The problem with these standards is is that they're too generic. Sometimes the disclosures are only checking a box, yes or no. They lack sometimes like uh, key performance indicators. And there are a lot of, of different uh, standards there. The, science-based uh, targets, um, and you've got uh, other that are more orientated uh, for financial entities, you know, like the task force uh, on, on climate-related uh, financial disclosures, and uh, that is a tool that is used by the United Nations Principles uh, for Responsible Investment, and they develop recommendations for disclosing a climate-related risk in financial finance. And you've got the Global Reporting Initiative. It's another sustainability reporting standard. You've got the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board. But all these standards, they're not specifically linked to sustainable development goals. So it's kind of a little bit confusing, you know, and that's why it's challenging you know, for, for companies to implement an ESG plan because uh, sometimes they become very overwhelmed and uh, they don't know from where they can start. You know? And I would say... First, that what they have to do is to consider their sector, what will be their targets, you know, and um, how they can reduce emissions, you know, how they can improve their the S component and the T component, the governance uh, component uh, within uh, their company, and then set up targets. Mm -hmm. You mentioned it there, it can be confusing for organizations. You've got this overlays of different standards, you've got non-governmental stand, non-government NGOs involved, you've got governmental regulation, you've got your own stakeholders pushing for certain attributes. Before we dig into how you can go about simplifying that world and coming up with a plan, I just want to touch a, a little bit more on, I mean, this is really challenging. It's hugely complex. You, you've, you've alluded to that. It's also challenging on other levels as well, right? It's difficult to, we're talking about 
externalities here and, and how to price those. We're talking about hidden attributes. So we, we've talked a couple of times on this podcast about there are there's emergent technology around tokenization, for example, that can track some of these. And it's also costly as well. This is a uh, you know this is an added cost to business, albeit with potentially some payoffs. Can you? And I think. It's probably the E, the, the environment, but particularly carbon is probably easier to have data on than the S and G. But can you just, uh, you, you live this day to day with organizations. Can you just help us understand, you know, how and how challenging and, and why it's challenging to really measure and actually tackle some of these, particularly the S and G bit? It's um, particularly difficult. So there's a lot of information on different standards, but there is not enough uh, data. And just to compare across uh, sectors, you know, and the regions, because we live in a globalized uh, economy, what you do with your company in region can impact people, the stakeholders in other regions and, and continents. You know? um, but uh, the E component, I think, is very important because when a company reduces emissions, it has a global impact, you know, reducing pollution, you know, and other effects. Compensating and offsetting emissions and uh, buying carbon offsets has a lot of value, not only uh, for the company, but uh, globally. And in particular, where these investments happened in the developing world, and it has um, different positive impacts. A um, lot of times, helps with the transfer of technology, training people, creating jobs. It has a big social component. At least the majority of, of birds where I've been involved in reducing emissions in developing countries, the social component was a, a, a core thing. So this is creating a lot of value. And um, uh, you mentioned about the cost, you know. Uh, there are different ways of uh, reducing cost. And it's getting into the project uh, in a development phase, you know, before the issuance of, of carbon credits. Of course, this needs um, uh, to have an understanding on, on the process of the different certifications on the assessing uh, the risks of, of the project uh, not issuing the expected amount of, of carbon credits, you know. But it's a way of reducing the cost of, um, of the carbon offsets. Also, uh, depending on, on how the companies, um, um, they, the type of, of carbon credits that they would like, you know, and the type of, of, of quality. So depending on the quality of the carbon credit, um, they will be able to buy the carbon credit for a lower or, a, or you know, maybe a more expensive uh, price, you know. I, I will say expensive, you know, because I think the, the cost of these carbon offsets, uh, I think for the moment, uh, they're very approachable, you know, for a lot of uh, of companies, you know. Um, so um, I don't think now we have um, um, a scarcity on, on carbon offsets. But um, um, if uh, more and more companies, they realize that uh, this is the way to meet um, zero net targets, and there will be um, an increase in the amount of these carbon offsets. When a client comes to you and says, I need to put this in place. I know it can lower my cost of capital. I know it can um, attract talent. It's important, you know, for my for my my employees and my family. How do you approach navigating an organization through building some kind of, of ESG plan? Well, first is to understand uh, where they are in the, um, the ESG implementation. No? If if they are starting from scratch, or or they have done some progress. And also understand what are the requirements of their stakeholders, you know. Uh, maybe it's a company that is part of a supply chain and, uh, um, and they want to implement a, an ESG plan because one of their major clients um, has already implemented an ESG plan and it's following a specific standard. You know? So it made sense for that company, you know, to, to follow maybe the same type of standard that uh, one of their major clients is, uh, is is following, you know, or maybe uh, this company is a, in a sector where an ESG standard is uh, is the trend, and uh, 
it will be useful for them to participate in, in that standard because it's uh, a better way to compare their progress uh, with, uh, with their competitors. So this is also relevant. Or maybe they don't want to follow a specific standard and, and then create uh, their own key performance indicators. And, and some companies don't want to follow a standard because um, these standards are relatively new and uh, we don't know how they're going to evolve. No? So they don't want to be on the hook on the, on, uh, on, on the need to comply with uh, some requirements that uh, they don't know how they will look like in, in the future. You know, and uh, reputational issues that uh, could be attached to, to them. You know? uh, so the key thing is to set up, uh, to see where they are now and, and set targets you know, um, uh, with um, key metrics uh, that are uh, measurable. And um, try to reduce emissions internally and then compensate with uh, carbon offsets. Yeah. So it's kind of what's the... Uh, this is the phrase you've used earlier was you know i guess what's their main concern and what are their goals so uh, i think it's i think it's to highlight it right there's market access is a key one increasingly if, if people are going to look to their own standards that will then generate requirements of people their suppliers and also they in turn are supplying someone else which will also may have standards so there's kind of the market access piece and if you're meeting one standard in one region uh, which requires it from a compliance standpoint you know spreading that to all your global operations has a lot of benefit um, so you've got market access you've mentioned differentiation then you've got a range of options to how you um, then implement something what, what do you think are the key factors for success as to whether an organization really um, can at whatever level and whatever scope make a successful um, ESG plan initiative or embed it in their organization? What do you see as, as, as makes that successful? I think key is transparency. Reporting what you have and have a, a long-term plan with key targets and, and, and goals, you know, that allow investors and the stakeholders to identify how the company is going to meet these goals and, uh, and the benefits you know, um, um, they are providing. Um, so transparency is, is a key. Whether they use um, standards that are already available or, or they use their own metrics, but uh, to be transparent and get uh, also good advice. You know, if, if they're going to buy carbon credits, just uh, because uh, there is an auditor there that has um, uh, measured those uh, emission reductions uh, because they come from um, a registry doesn't mean that they are really good quality, you know. So they have to understand what is good quality for them. So, so, so there's a transparency, putting in key metrics and, and measuring them. Organizationally, how do you see companies tackle this? Are they appointing an ESG office, where, where does accountability typically sit within organizations? Well, the accountability, you know, it comes um, first, um, what they are obliged to do because of, of the role action, you know, that's the first thing. But also from s stakeholders, you know, like uh, investors, uh, consumers. Um, I think we are going to see more and more scrutiny, you know, on, on how companies tackle uh, climate change, you know. Um, what they do um, uh, to reduce uh, their emissions and how they communicate this. But some companies, they're like uh, doing good things for the environment, but they don't know how to communicate them. And maybe they are not so transparent. And others, um, they might not, I would say, explain things how they should have explained them. And they might mislead uh, with their communications, you know. So, uh, I think it's important uh, how you communicate um, what you are doing for the environment and, and uh, the targets and that um, you would like to, to seek as, a, as an organization. Mm. And are you seeing, but from an individual standpoint, are companies appointing uh, ESG officers or does this sit with regular, you know, on the uh, with the CFO? Does it sit within commercial? How how organizations actually 
implementing uh, these these programs internally? Well, some organizations um, they are hiring head of uh, sustainability and to implement um, ESG plans. Um, and I think this will be separated from the CFO responsibilities and uh, um, other departments. It should be in coordination with um, uh, the CFO, the CEO, with uh, the different departments. But um, um, companies, I think they should give importance uh, um, to sustainability and and, uh, and have a team if uh, if they can know if they have the budget you know um, to internally address these issues um, some other companies um, they they prefer to appoint uh, consultants uh, to to help them uh, implement in the ESG plans but they're always in coordination with key decision makers of the of the company because it has a big impact on on the on the company yeah no and, and I think that's a trend we're seeing as well so you've got you kind of got this. You, you roughly the plan is typically designed about what an organisation is looking to achieve. That will be dependent on what market they're in. If you're an oil trader, it might be emissions, or um, you know, in the ag space, it might be um, sustainability around use of fertilisers, for example. Um, and then you've got this choice about okay, how are you, are you going to use external standards, internal standards? But the key is this making it measurable and and transparent and then the communication around that and then obviously you've got to create the organizational design internally to be able to deliver it i, I want to go back to what i think are the the positive outcomes of getting this right um beyond just the financial piece it, it is a real challenge and i think there's some um, lessons to be learned there for example one of the ones that you use with me is that it's quite a risky business signing up to some of these external standards, right? That can, because they are constantly evolving. Can you talk to that a little bit? Yes. Um, I think it's risky if you don't understand the responsibilities. And you know? also before signing into a specific standard, um, companies, they, they need to understand uh, the reporting obligations and the disclosing obligations, you know? So it's not just uh, paying the fee and, and um, asking a consultant uh, to do the paperwork. You know, there are a lot of responsibilities, you know, attached to be or to sign up, you know, to one of these uh, standards. Uh, I'm saying that uh, companies should avoid them, you know, that they, they should uh, understand uh, what they are committing to. And the other thing is that because these standards are evolving, you know, as, as the market is evolving, they could implement uh, some type of, of requirements and know and that um, the companies were not foreseeing that they'll, they will have to report you know uh, so they just should be aware of this you know um, the, the benefits of, of being part of a standard is is that um, it will be kind of um, easier for investors uh, to compare companies you know because they will use the same uh, key metrics because one of the um, issues that um, uh, investors uh, have uh, when the, they have to do an assessment uh, um, of the ESG uh, uh, plan and, and perspective of the of the company is is that um, uh, because there are so many standards and uh, they are relatively new and not all the companies are on board they have difficulty to assess uh, that company from the environmental, social and, and governance uh, point of view. Uh, so some of investors, they decide to take a, a, a different approach and, um, and and use their own metrics, you know, um, and not uh, consider um, maybe um, the, the standards that uh, the companies are, are following. Mm. So you've got the benefits of obviously like for like for comparison. It takes some of the heavy lifting off actually trying to design these things internally. But because these are evolving, they, there could be an, um, you know, an example where uh, a new requirement or a new sort of piece of reporting is that actually you, know, you might not be able to meet or puts you in a negative light that then would force you, know, you to leave that standard, which from a reputational standpoint, I imagine, is calamitous. Yes, and, and this has happened. There's examples with ESG scoring, credit scoring companies. Uh, they're also implementing ESG scores, you know, and uh, they might have uh, given um, a good score to, to a company, 
an ECA score, and and then something happens and um, and that has a big impact on the ESE score, and and the company is on the spotlight, you know. Um, so um, one key thing is 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 that uh, um, ESE is is uh, uh, has to be managed as um, three major risks, you know, that that they ha- the companies have to take in, into account, you know, and and. Uh, they have to address uh, these uh, risks as uh, as a financial risk. Yeah. So whilst it brings the positives, it also introduces new risks. Not that those risks aren't there, and if you if you aren't addressing them in any way, in fact, that only heightens them. So you've got pros and cons around which standards you use, but I think the really this is probably going to become more over time viewed as a significant risk within an organization, whether they're being addressed or not, but you're certainly reducing risks if you are. The positives, though, I think it seem to me like they're only going to increase. You've got that, the market access piece, um, uh, probably better defined as as you being um, potentially excluded from a particular market because you aren't meeting standards, whether that's because um, one of your your customers refuses to deal with you or whether it's local regulators preclude you from being able to operate. You've spoken to me about this. There's a real advantage to being um, a front runner, uh, uh, early participant in ESG. Um, can you help us understand why that's the case? Why, why are the organizations that are starting to move quickly on this why are they going to really benefit from that? I think it's, it's good to show a track record on on how a company is uh, tackling uh, climate change. You know how they are reducing emissions. You know how they are investing, for example, in new technology. You know uh, for reducing emissions. Um, um, how they are buying um, carbon credits. You know to offset uh, their emissions. Like showing this track record is is very positive. Uh, not all the companies are doing it, and. Uh, so this it creates a differentiation between the companies that are already doing um, uh, on putting in plans uh, these measures and the ones that are not doing anything. Um, I, I think uh, not doing anything is is is, is not an option. You know, uh, we see that um, uh, ESG uh, is is going to be incorporated uh, because of regulation or because of investors uh, they put pressure. You know, on the, um, and companies, you know, to address uh, uh, ESG um, risk factors, and um, also as a supplier, if you're a supplier of a big company uh, that has an ESG plan, uh, because you are part of their scope three of of emissions, uh, at the end of the day, you will be obliged, you know, to implement this plan. No, so I see this as a very positive point of view uh, for the companies, you know, that they start implementing these plans. They plan ahead. They assess their risk and opportunities. I think there are a lot of opportunities, you know, for, for the companies um, that can show this uh, track record, um, that can show uh, measurable key metrics on, on how they tackle um, ESG. They are gaining expertise, you know. I think uh, gaining experience uh, in in a new market and a new trends is is key. It seems like we 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 continue to zoom back in on the environment piece of ESG, whether that's climate change or emissions reduction, I should say, or reducing pollutants. Is that really where the sort of the the bang for the buck is for organisations? Simply because the social and governance piece is much harder to measure or, or people care less about it? I mean, is that, am I reading it wrong? Is it really the E is where it counts right now? The E is, I mean, the S and the G are also uh, important um, for talent retention and um, it complying with the local regulations, you know, uh, but it might be more local than than a global impact like uh, reducing emissions, you know, um, because as I was saying before, you know, when, when you reduce emissions uh, uh, implementing a project, uh, it has a global effect. The social and the governance uh, component are important uh, for a company, also for the stakeholders, but uh, maybe they are more difficult to measure. Um, it's easier. And we, now we have uh, the methodologies to measure uh, the E component, you know, and uh, we have uh, so many different uh, 
methodologies for different sectors um, and also depending on, on the on the region um, how to reduce those emissions um, and um, how to calculate those emission reductions and, uh, and calculate the carbon credits uh, generated from emission reductions it's like more measurable on the e component than the s and, and the g mm. and also i guess the prevalence of climate change as a global focus right now um, and presumably only getting more so with some of the changes in the administration uh, here in the US but also it's very much on people's minds as we as as we enter 2021 so but I get your point around the 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 s and g side it's just as important it's probably more uh, particular and local to where the companies operate and also what's important to their stakeholders and it's harder to measure yes but also um uh, sorry for the interruption, but I think the ESG factors also may overlap, you know, and um, when the, a company is investing in the reducing emissions, uh, they might have also an impact on the social and the governance uh, component, you know. Um, so that's why the E is so important, you know, because uh, it can lead to other risks uh, and reduce those risks on the S and the G component. Mm. Can you give an example of that? I think that's a fascinating point. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, for example, if you invest in um, implementing um, uh, solar panels in uh, isolated communities in Latin America, you know, for example, um, in Colombia, you know, I'm going to give a very concrete example. Like communities that didn't have access to electricity. So you invest in, the, in those uh, solar panels, uh, and um, uh, that has a social component because those communities uh, didn't have access to, to electricity. Giving them access to electricity, um, that is public service, you know, gives them access um, uh, to potentially have uh, cell phones, um, to, to have um, access to communications, you know. Um, maybe to potentially have access uh, to, to water. So you are improving uh, their lives conditions. Then uh, those, uh, that, that project could be eligible potentially to uh, generate uh, carbon credits. Carbon credits is a way also uh, to finance uh, that project. So you are helping that uh, local community to uh, meet uh, their goals of um, increasing their the standards of, of living. You know? So the E component is important because we're reducing emissions in the sense that um, instead of um, using diesel power generators, they're using solar power. But uh, the social component is so evident, you know, that is, I think it's a, it's a good example of overlapping. So thanks for that. As you look forward over the next five or 10 years, even the next year, what are the big trends you see in ESG that business leaders need to be aware of? I would say the biggest uh, trend is, first of all, what will happen um, with the U.S., you know, uh, with the change in, in government, you know, and the expectation of the U.S. Um, joining again the, the Paris Accord and, uh, and the global impact that uh, this might have. Because... Um, this is not a regional effort. This is a, a global effort, you know. And uh, we know um, that uh, we need the the, the main polluters um, to to make an effort uh, to reduce emissions and uh, implement also uh, policies, you know, that uh, tackle uh, the three um, ESG factors. Um, so this is one of the trends, the, the policy, you know, and uh, how the, the governments are tackling um, climate change and the social and governance uh, component. Um, the, the other trends is that um, uh, we'll see more pressure uh, on, on companies joining standards to measure their progress on, on ESG and, and pressure from, from investors. There are some trends on, on the... ESDG goals, you know, and, and how to value them. Like, uh, for example, Vera, uh, they are trying to implement uh, methodologies that will issue uh, potentially sustainable development um, 
Vista assets, you know. So this is the key element of carbon credits, but for sustainable development goals. Um, we don't know if they're going to end up doing that or, or maybe um, what they're going to do is to label the, um, a project that is in, in compliance with one of the sustainable development uh, goals. So the trend is um, to, to get more uh, transparency you know, and measure how uh, this um, ESG implementation is, is progressing. You know? And um, I think that we're going to see uh, um, more uh, positive impact on the, the benefits on um, implementing ESG plans. Uh, for example, with uh, banks uh, providing loans, um, cheaper conditions or, or best conditions um, uh, to companies uh, that have a sustainability plan, you know, a sustainability plan that is measurable. If I'm hearing you correctly, the the risks of not having a plan are only going to get greater as regulation uh, becomes more um, onerous, as um, market participation becomes more contingent on your ESG plans, but also the upsides are going to get more as well with, with cheaper financing, uh, presumably better access to talent, better access to markets. I guess to wrap up, what would your single key bit of advice be to anyone listening to this who perhaps doesn't have much of an ESG plan, whether it's a service company like mine, yours, or whether it's a, a big industrial, what, what do you think is the, you know, what's your key message? The key message is to, to start implementing a, an ESG plan because it's something inevitable, you know, that um, it will happen uh, uh, if, not, if it doesn't happen in the near future, in the medium term, you know, and uh, in there's advantages of, of being a, a front runner and now is the opportunity you know to to implement those plans uh, if they don't know how to implement them to get advice and start addressing these challenges fantastic well it's been a, a really interesting overview of what is only going to become a uh, a more and more relevant and prevalent topic in the commodities world and um, thanks very much for joining us thanks to you my pleasure to be here Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and Human Capital, a search firm dedicated to the commodities sector, go to www.hcinsider.global, where you'll find more original content on the commodities sector and more details on our offerings as a search firm and our locations around the world. Thanks again for listening. Thank you.